let's talk about this, this new strain first. Uh, I looked into it a little bit more. 14 mutations, seven are in the spike protein apparently. There have been thousands of mutations already uh, in this virus. So it's, it's more contagious. I think what scares people, Scott, or what causes concern is if, if it's, it's mutating fairly easily, is it possible there could be a mutation that could make it more lethal? This is not that. This is more contagious. But it makes you think is it, that if that were to happen, that would, that would be very concerning. Right. And, and the other question is, is it possible that there could be a mutation that obviates prior immunity so people who got the infection the can get it again yeah. or slips past our vaccines? Right. This does appear to be – this is a mutation. The question is, was this uh, the result of selective pressure? So was this selected for because it's more contagious? Or was it what we call founder's effect? It just happened to get into London, in, London into some early super spreading events, and it became the predominant strain, but it's not really – um, selected for. We now think it's selected for. We now think that this is more transmissible. It doesn't seem to have mutated the surface proteins of the virus in a way that they would slip past our vaccines or prior immunity. In fact, we don't think that that's the case. But what this does suggest is that eventually this virus probably will evolve its surface proteins in a way that they won't be recognized by the antibodies we have right now. We will have to update the vaccines. Most viruses mutate, as you know. Um, some viruses, like flu, evolve their surface proteins very quickly, and that's why we need a different flu vaccine every season. Some viruses can't really change their surface proteins, like measles. This virus seems to fall someplace in between. It's not going to change its surface proteins very rapidly, that spike protein, but it will change it over time. And then the final point is that it's probably a good thing that we use the entire spike protein in our vaccines, because what we're getting is what we call a polyclonal uh, response. We're developing antibodies to many different regions of that protein. So even if one part of that protein were mutated and some antibodies no longer recognized it, there would be antibodies to other parts of that protein. So this probably will not slip past our vaccines very easily, but eventually we will have to update the vaccines. The antigen tests are a different question, and the antibody drugs for that matter. If those tests are primed to a very specific region of that spike protein and that region undergoes some change, it could potentially slip past those tests. So we're going to need a way to monitor for these strains and update some of our technology. Well, hadn't even, uh, hadn't even thought about that. Well, you remember the old days, Scott, there'd be a mutation. It'd be like, whoa, there's a mutation. All you had was the so-called the phenotype. We can get the genotype immediately now. So we, within seconds, we, uh, literally, maybe hours, we can sequence the mutation. So we got that going for us, which, uh, which we never had before. Plus, we have this new platform, this new uh, messenger RNA platform where you could easily, if you had to, you could, you could introduce a new version right. of a vaccine if it, if it mutated around it, right? Aren't both of those things positive? Right. The uh, advent of synthetic vaccines makes it very easy to update these vaccines, and we will be doing much better surveillance than we've done historically using um, sequencing. So um, yeah. we do that for flu. What, what, we sequence strains of flu. We're going to have to do that for COVID as well. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.